I want to tell you, you know, I, uh, I consider myself a fairly perceptive person. And so because I love this community, I want to give you the benefit of that gift of being perceptive. And I wanted to let you know something that you may not know. Um, I wanted to let you know that people are still angry out there, that um, people are on edge, that um, everyone is not okay. And I say that with a smile because you know this, um, but I sometimes forget when I begin to feel a little bit more positive energy or I have a little bit of optimism, I forget that not everyone is seeing what I'm seeing and feeling what I'm feeling. So for example, I, uh, I, wanted, I made a post on social media and the intent was I wanted to think about, I wanted to hear about what people were missing. So were they missing Broadway shows? Were they missing going to concerts? Were they missing a particular sporting event? And so I put on the social media, I put out the question, I said, you know, if you could have your vaccine and you could safely attend an event, you know, what would you, go, what would you choose? Which of these things, what, name a concert, name a theater production. And I got a lot of great responses, but I also got a flood of negativity with that surprised me. People saying, oh my gosh, John, how could you act as though vaccines were the cure-all and how could you, you know, uh, put something that's sort of irresponsible out into the world that everything's just fine. Um, and of course, I, I realized, wow, people are really in this mode of anxiety still. And I think we are all, to some degree, we're in the PTSD of our recent past. I think we're now beginning to see the effects of sustained trauma on our lives because it's been a while that we have been in this state of sustained trauma. I don't know if you, many of you here remember, you know, I think I met this community, I first kind of was introduced right after the election of 2016. And one of the first times that I shared with you in a service, um, I talked about a purchase that I had recently made. And I'm not sure you remember what that purchase was, but it was the purchase of a blood pressure monitor. Because I had said at the time that, you know, I went to the doctor and he told me that my blood pressure is really high. So we're going to kind of get some medication. But he said, I want you to monitor this at home. And I, you know, I told you about going to CVS and saying, hey, give me the top of the line thing, right? I got this big cuff. And the, the short of it was, is that I stopped using it a few days later because I would look at it and it would show me how high my blood pressure was and that would make my blood pressure really high. And so what I decided to do is just realize it's probably normally high and stop using it. Now, here's what I'm hoping in 2021, in March, I'm hoping that my blood pressure is now going to begin to reside at a more reasonable level and that I haven't simply gotten used to this level of elevated adrenaline. And, but the latter may actually be really likely that a higher blood pressure for me is simply my default setting right now. And that's the way that stress and conflict can work in our lives. They can, they can alter us. And I want you to think about your patterns uh, of thinking today, because patterns of thinking can be difficult to break, and that can actually work in beautiful and less than beautiful ways. Patterns in general can be really helpful, or patterns can be really dangerous. So you start exercising. Let's say you decide to start exercising once every three or four days, and you enjoy it. And so you begin to work out every other day. And suddenly a pattern of daily exercise is normal for you. And you develop this normalcy that involves physical health. But you may stop one day and say, I'll take a day off. And then you sort of take two days off. And then you may exercise again, but then you take another day off. And you start spacing out the days between your workouts. And then the inactivity starts to feel normal. And so that momentum either way is really important. And we can develop a momentum 
as we are making decisions and that momentum can be healthy or it can be detrimental and um, moving things in the other direction can be really challenging. So I want you to think about what kind of momentum you have in your head lately. How is that momentum shaping your emotional response to the world? Do you feel as though your thoughts are in a momentum that is toward positivity and hope and goodness and possibility? Or is your momentum still toward fear and negativity and conflict? Because I think we've all felt what sustained urgency can do in our systems. And we have been in that elevated state for at least a year, but likely more like four or five years. Um, I got good news. I was able to get a, a spot to make a, my vaccine date scheduled because there's some larger uh, places that are starting to welcome group four. And I've been group four and I'm on team four and I've been cheering for group four forever. And someone said to me last night, hey, you can, you can register now in group four. And I just... I felt like I'd already been given a vaccine. I'd been boosted with sort of hope. It was like, oh my gosh, I feel that rush of energy that is making me expand my ideas of what's gonna be possible. I was sort of surprised at just the prospect of making an appointment. It just kind of brought me up to a much higher level of optimism. And I think the election results for many of us, and I think the arrival of the vaccine are giving us a sense of light on the horizon that uh, you know we're moving into what feels like a more relatively uh, normal experience. And after 12 months of pandemic isolation and election turbulence and relational fractures and racial divides and terrorist attacks, it can be difficult to create a healthy new pattern of thinking. And lately I've been wondering how we can find a sustainable way of being in the world that allows us to have our convictions and our emotional and physical health so that we don't fall asleep to the painful realities of the world, but that we don't hold on too tightly to our anger and our fear either. Um, so it was about 10 years ago when I realized that I sleep in a certain way. And I actually sleep with my fists tightly clenched. Now, I've probably been doing this since I was young. But I notice it now because I'll wake up and my hands will be so tightly clenched that they're red and they're swollen. And I, I thought that's a funny metaphor for life. Waking up every day with a fighter's mindset, say, look, what, where, is it, where is the fight? What do, what do I have to deal with? And I think a lot of us have had to wake up that way every day for a long time that you've gotten out of bed or maybe you haven't even you just your eyes opened you realized you were awake and your mind went to all the threats right it went to election results or supreme court case decisions or it went to legislation that was you know present or just to what someone was doing out there so there was constantly this fear that the moment i wake up i have to start fighting and that's not sustainable. And what I'm hoping for us is that today we can think about finding some balance, that we can detox from that fight, that we can redirect our energies so that we can together be agents of compassion in the world, which is what I know we want to do together. And I want, us to, I want you to think about your personal resources. So the working capital that you have of caring for people and the way that these resources are tied to your generosity. See, we all have three powerful, but ultimately finite resources in this life, right? We have time, we have money, and we have our influence, the people that we know, our relationships. And we begin walking into the kind of life that we're meant to have and the kind of life that can repair the planet by learning how to wisely and responsibly use these resources to alleviate suffering, to generate goodness, to rectify injustice, to care for people, to create community. So we have these resources and our ability to help in the world and to give hope in the world is the sum total of these three resources of time and money and relational influence and our generosity with them. 
And I think part of the reason that most of us in this community are feeling, have felt the weight of these days is that caring for other people is an investment of yourself in something that is beyond you. And that, that caring for people will always involve some kind of sacrifice. It will involve you giving up a resource that you intended, intended to use for yourself for someone else, whether you measure that in material things or time or presence or energy or emotional bandwidth or worry, some of those things you're going to give on behalf of someone else. It may be the money that you'd carved out for a new pair of shoes or the rainy afternoon that you designated for a nap or the weekend hours that you'd like to have spent in another Netflix bender or just a moment to rest quietly while uninterrupted. And so something that you meant for yourself, you're going to expend for someone else. And so somewhere along the way to living others centered, we all reallocate some of our resources to meet someone else's need and be moved by that need. And what I know about this community is that it's filled with generous people. And generous people have one thing in common. They operate within a very specific counterintuitive mathematical understanding of the world that they, they know that if they part with something on behalf of someone else, it will be returned to them tenfold, that their original subtraction will yield a greater addition eventually. They trust that they will get back what they give and then some. And being the generous people that you are, that can be a liability if you begin to stay in that resource deficit too long, which is really difficult sometimes to see. So in other words, it can be really easy to see when we're in the red financially, right? We know that, that's, that's obvious. When we are in deficit emotionally or physically, that's not necessarily easy to spot. And often we don't realize that we've given out too much of ourselves emotionally or physically until some glaring alarm goes off. Um, I'm driving to the airport, 6 a.m., got the whole family there. We're going on this great trip. Going to be a lot of fun. Everyone made it out on time out of the house, which never happens. I was not feeling stressed, or so I thought. But what started to happen was I was driving down uh, 540, and my heart started beating fast. And I thought, well, that's odd. And then it started to beat faster. And then my hands started to sweat. And then I started to feel like I was swirling. And this is with the whole family in the car, which is disconcerting to the people who are not driving. But it got to the point where I just pulled immediately over to the side of the road and I thought, I'm having a heart attack. And I just had the feeling that I was going to expire, just pass out. Well, it turns out that it wasn't a heart attack, that it was a, an anxiety attack which shocked me because I didn't think that I was having anxiety at the time. I was actually in a really positive place. But what that was, as many of you know, was my body giving off an alarm saying, stop, this is not sustainable. This activity, this stress, all that you're dealing with is not sustainable. And I, you may not have had that happen to you. I hope it hasn't, but you've probably had a moment where your body or maybe someone around you or maybe your circumstances was an alarm that said, you're, the way that you care for the world, how wrapped up you are in the problems or the struggle is detrimental to your health. And the question that I have for you today is, how can you have a compassionate heart and not be swallowed up by it? How can we move into the next season of our lives and of this community and of our nation and be wise caretakers of our personal resources? And I think one of the ways is by paying attention to what I'm going to call outrage addiction. Um, I find that many of us are holding residual anger and resentment. And it's often a challenge to stop the pattern of confrontation that we've been in. We can be so conditioned to the battle that we become dependent on it. And many people fall into an addictive pattern of opposition. So for example, you may have spent the last, oh, let's say four and a half years pushing against a politician 
or a party or a piece of legislation or a religious movement. And now, even if that has been somewhat resolved or changed, you can't figure out how to stop fighting. And many people I know are seeing that, okay, this guy, this Trump is gone, but their friends and relatives are not. And the resentment and the animosity and the conflict are still there. And I thought about, I remember hearing an NFL player, a football player, talk about the difficulties that he had of being hostile and aggressive off the field, that he couldn't recalibrate to a normal non-combative life when he wasn't playing football. And I think the past few years have left many of us struggling with our internal temperature, where we're easily angered, we're easily triggered, we're impatient. And here's how I want to frame this for us today. You heard that expression, um, I'm a lover, not a fighter, right? I always used to say, actually, I'm a runner, and then a lover, and then a fighter. So I'd prefer to avoid, but then I'll love, and fighting would be my last choice. And I think that perfectly encapsulates how I'd like you to approach the emotional and physical toll of caring for people, fighting, loving, and running. So one of the keys to understanding outrage addiction and overcoming it and overcoming the fatigue of the fight is in our energy orientation and realizing where our energies are being expended, where we are putting our resources, where we are directing our attention and making sure that we have a diversity of experience. So for example, let's say that I want to oppose racism. I should spend some of my energy in confronting systemic injustice or opposing policies or debating people. I should be in that kind of fight for racial justice. But I also need to make sure that I'm spending my time with people who are under duress and caring for them, that I'm living in diverse community with people, that I'm partnering with organizations doing positive anti-racism work. So sometimes I'm naming privilege and pushing back against political movements and systemic issues, right? I'm fighting, but sometimes I'm living in relationships with people who are affected by these movements and systems, so I'm loving. See, both of these tactics have a similar end. They both combat racism, but they're very different energy allotments. They require a different approach, and they do something different in me. And if we only exist in a battle posture, and we only fight, then we're going to become negative and exhausted and bitter. And we need to make sure that we're cha channeling some of our energy into the act of loving people. And then really important, we need to know when to step away from both of these things, right? The fighting and the loving and simply be to run from the crowd to a place of self-care and self-empathy. So this week, the question I want you to consider is, when and where do I need to reallot or reorient my energies to get a healthier pattern? For you, this might mean um, in, you know, social media fast. You may have to get off social media. Or you may have to get a change of scenery so that you can get out of your own head. It might mean you spend less time in confrontation and more time in contemplation. It may mean that you avoid toxic people or that you spend time in community with people who've transformed their anger into something more productive. I used to wonder how my conservative friends were miserable over the last four years, right? They had their guy in, and their party in power. And I thought, how could they still be miserable? And now I sort of realize it. It's because they were in the throes of an outrage addiction that we may be in. See, even in a community like this one, we can easily become complaining communities, people who come together because of their opposition to something but who get stuck in a negative expression. And the more energy that we expend complaining about or stressing about people who we believe are hateful or ignorant, the less energy we're going to have to create or participate in an alternative and more productive counterpoint to them. So I think that's the most, that's the greatest danger for those of us who feel deeply that we don't become compassionate martyrs, that we don't, that we're not destroyed by our own hearts, right? Not becoming so consumed by suffering that we succumb to it. 
And so in all this work, in caring for the world, in being engaged in what's happening and being aware, you're expiring early. That's not the goal. It's not the desired outcome. And neither is you being perpetually angry or stressed out. So I'd like you to make sure that you have empathy for people that you fight for, and then you save some of that empathy for yourself. So this week, think about resource allotment and your energy orientation this week. Spend some of your time fighting, some of your time loving, and when you're tired, some time running from it all and resting. 